chapter 2, verses 14 through 18, the day the devil was destroyed. The day the devil was destroyed. Now, he doesn't have his final resting place yet, but he's been destroyed, and he knows it. And that's why he's breathing all the habits that he can on your life and my life and everyone that knows the Lord is supposed to save you. And those that don't, he's interfering with their salvation. He's giving them false concept that they're in control. They can, they can decide their destiny. So Jesus Christ is the one that you need to put your faith and trust in. Amen. Amen. That's the only way to heaven. Uh, it's a verse-by-verse study that we're going through, and this is the day the day the devil was destroyed. Oh, David tells, David Dyke, Pastor David Dyke tells a story. Now, I want to share it with you because I think this fits very appropriately. Uh, he said, during his senior year of college, he served as a youth pastor at First Baptist Church in Prattville, Alabama, uh, and uh, and on weekends, he and Cindy, his wife, they lived in a mobile home and farm with a bunch of church families. And one of them had a son named Richard who was about five or six. And David said, he was my buddy. He stayed with me everywhere I went. And he said, I, uh, we were walking out of the pasture one day and we came upon a dead horse. And he said, I can't remember the horse's name, but we were just calling him Bingo for the sake of it. And he said, Richard, little five-year-old Richard looked at me and said, what happened to Bingo? And he said, I tried as delicately as I could to explain to him. So I knelt down and I said, Richard, Bingo has gone to be with Jesus. He said, I'll never forget his reply. Well, what's Jesus going to do with a dead horse? <laughs> <laughs> he said, I guess I didn't do a very good job of explaining that. So I'm like, yeah, we hope we do a little bit better job of that. <laughs> what Jesus is going to do with a dead horse? But uh, stand, if you will, for reading Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. Insomuch then as the children have, been, have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through his death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. Notice he was destroyed. And release those who through fear of death were all their lifetimes subject to bondage. For indeed he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make perpetuation for their sin. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Father, thank you for the reading of your word this morning. I pray, God, now that you help me get out of the way. Let the Holy Spirit preach this message. Lord, I'm so glad to know that the devil, though he doesn't have his final resting place now, and, and it won't be a place of rest for him, but... He's not, in, he's not bound up in hell now, but he does know that he's already been destroyed. He's been defeated by the blood that you shed upon Calvary. I pray, God, today that everyone listening knows that salvation. If they don't, God, may the Holy Spirit speak to their heart, bring them to the need of salvation, and, bring them, and save them this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. You may be seated. Now, the second part of that passage I read to you deals with Jesus and his high priesthood. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that this morning because that's, we can cover that in detail when we get to Hebrews chapter 4 where we, have, we see we have the great, the best, the only high priest. But I want, to, uh, I want to look at the fact that the devil has been destroyed this morning. Now that word destroyed that y'all read to you in the scripture is it, actually uh, kataros, uh, which is the Greek word and it means to be taped down. It's like in that, uh, what they call pro wrestling, <laughs> which is an oxymoron. But <laughs> uh, but uh, it's like they call it, in that they call it, they call it a smackdown. Well, the devil's had his smackdown. He's been defeated. And that's what we want to talk about. Uh, first of all, as the author of the sin, devil created the fear of death. There's a connection in Scripture between sin and death. For the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life our, in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus our Lord, Romans 6.23. There is a direct connection. God placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And gave them a perfect environment in Genesis chapter 2. To be said, take charge, be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth. Enjoy all the fruits of the garden except one tree. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The day you eat that tree, you will die. Now Satan came along and confronted Eve right off the bat, I believe, and put a question mark where God put a period. He said, did God say, did he really say that you can't eat from any tree in the garden? Satan is still twisting his words. Today, he's still twisting the word. God will make you a promise, and the devil will twist it around and ask you a question. Amen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
In Genesis 3, 4, the serpent says to the woman, you shall not, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. We all know what happened. Eve ate the fruit, gave some to Adam, and he ate it, and from there, the world has been in trouble ever since. They birthed to the shortest poem ever, called Troubles, and it goes, Troubles, Adam had it. Adam had it. <laughs> okay. But they didn't die right off the head. But remember, God created man in his own image. He created you and with a triune nature, body, soul, and spirit. We have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three entities, but one being. You are three entities, but one being. Somebody said, explain to me how we how you can have a triune God. I like what uh, I believe was if the double I can't remember that. Someone said, I, I'll explain the Trinity when you can explain to me how you can have uh Men, uh, how you can have total darkness in the world uh, in a room but only one light. Now light, as long as you got that light, you don't have total darkness. It's triune in nature. Your body, soul, and spirit. And when they sinned, they died spiritually. They were separated from God. That fellowship that they had with God before they uh, violated His commandment was gone. And they began, they died spiritually. And they began to die emotionally. And eventually, they died physically. They didn't die, didn't lose that death. It's progressive thing. Progressive. They died in their soul, and then they died in their bodies. And before sin, there was no death in the world. No death in the world before sin. But when sin entered, the world shame entered, and death followed. And the devil has used that death to keep people in fear every day since then. When Adam and Eve experienced that shame, they made fig leaves. They fig leaves and made clothes out of them. Covered their nakedness. They hid from God. God came along and said, Adam, where are you? And God knew where Adam was. See, that's the thing. When God addresses you, He knows what He, he already asked. When He asks you a question like that, He already knows. He just wants you to admit it. He, he, Adam was trying to hide from God because he had sinned against God. And Adam, He called Adam out. He wanted him to admit what they'd done. He said, Adam, what have you done? Then the shame turned to a blame game. And Adam said, it's not my fault, it's that woman you gave me. She gave me the fruit. Then he said, not my fault, that serpent did. Now actually, if you think about it, what Adam was saying to God, <coughs> ultimately was, God, it was your fault. Because you gave me that woman. If you hadn't given me that woman, I would have never seen it. She's like trying to pass the blame game. Hey, we still do it today. If you got to, listen, I said before, having one child doesn't qualify as parenthood. You gotta have at least two. Because if something gets broke, you gotta figure out which one did. Because they're both gonna blame the other one. Amen? Amen. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. What me? What me? I didn't do it either. What me? Well, somebody worked that. The blame game. And so they started blaming. In other words, Adam blamed Eve, and Eve blamed the serpent. The serpent didn't have a leg to stand on. Look at Alright, you look at me. <laughs> Jesus pointed out the evil nature of Satan's character. He said in John 8, 44, he was a murderer from the beginning, beginning and he does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he's a liar and the father of all of it. Jesus called Satan a thief in John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. We have an abundant life in Jesus Christ. The devil tried to take that away from you, but he can't. He can't. So before the devil showed up, there was no sin and no death. I just lost the life somewhere. Yeah, I'm okay. Um, Charles Spurgeon was one, one of my favorite preachers. Now he was he was a 19th century preacher. He preached in London, England. Some of you are familiar with his works. He was called to pastor a church in London at age 19. And he pastored there for 38 years and he died at age 57. And if you want to read some really flowery sermons, read some of Charles Haddon's version of the sermon. Now, uh, I don't quote him a whole lot because when you read it, it is very flowery. I mean, he could, he could paint you, literally paint a picture with words for you. But there's two things I want you to know about him. First of all, he enjoyed a cigar every night. He said he smoked it to the glory of God. He had a cigar every night. Matter of fact, he had to finally he finally gave him up because he, he said he walked past a uh, pharmacy one day and he saw a sign out there advertising a cigar that said the kind Charles Spurgeon smokes. He said, I knew right then I had to give it up. I was being a stumbling block to somebody. 
But he did, for a long time, he had to go every night. Second, he struggled with depression. He struggled with a great deal of depression. Also, he had to spend months in the south of France to recover from what he called the dark night of the soul. Now, here was a man of God that suffered from depression. Depression is very real. And I love to quote his sermons, but in December 19, 1857, I don't quote him often, he preached a message from this text, and here's what he said. I want to read it to you. Listen to, listen to the flowery word. Death is Satan's delight. He conceives death to be his masterpiece because of its terror and because of the ruin which it works. No doubt he gloats over our sickness, but death to him uh, is to him a theme of as much delight in his incapable of and his eternal misery. He, as far as he can, shouts for joy when he witnesses by one piece of treasure he swept the world with the broom of destruction and hurried all men to the tomb. Never was his malicious heart so full of hellish joy as when he saw Abel stretched upon the earth, slain by the club of his brother. Aha, said Satan, this is the first of all intelligent creatures that has died. Oh, how I rejoice. This is the crowning hour of my dominion. Can't you just see Satan rejoice over that? Hey, man, can they paint you a picture with words. I can just take, take in the broom and sweep it out into history. Listen to me. From the time sin and death entered the human equation until the cross, people have known they're going to die and it caused them to fear. And that's what Satan wants you to live in. Fear. Fear. Fear of death. Let me tell you something, folks. If you're a child of God, you have nothing to fear from death. Death is Psalm 23 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It is a shadow. I have never seen a shadow that hurt me. Never shadow, never bothered me. We walk in the valley of the shadow of death. Because all of death is is a separation from here and eternity in glory with the Lord Jesus Christ if you're a child of God. That, listen, we're all, something happened on the cross and it changed everything. Satan put fear in the people of death. The cross took away that fear. Number two, when Jesus died, he disarmed the power of the devil. In 1972, Hal Lindsey wrote a book entitled Satan is Alive and Well on Planet Earth. Now, he was correct about Satan being alive, but he was wrong about Satan being well. Satan is not well. He's alive, but he hasn't been well since the day that Jesus died, the day Jesus gave him his spiritual smackdown. Here's what the Bible says happened the day Jesus was crucified in Colossians 2. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them. He won. He won. Those powers and authorities, were, they were disarmed and publicly shamed when Jesus died on the cross. The devil and the demon. As a fallen angel, Lucifer knew the reason Jesus took on flesh and came to the planet Earth. Back in the Garden of Eden, you had the first promise of Jesus in Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. I think it's interesting. I want to point out something here. Notice it says between your seed and her seed. Now most of you know the woman doesn't have the seed. That's the man. So for a long time, theologians struggled with that passage of Scripture. And then we realized the Holy Spirit can see the child, Jesus Christ. So he said, the her seed, I will put enmity, I will put division between your seed and her seed. Meaning, they will cry, and then he said, I will, I, you know, I, he will uh, bruise his heel, he will crush your head. That's the first promise of Jesus Christ in the Scripture. So from the time Jesus was born, in Bethlehem, Satan was there striking at the heel of Jesus Christ. When he saw him as an infant in a manger, he stirred up uh, Herod the Great's jealousy and caused all the to kill all the boy babies in Bethlehem. But God sent an angel to warn Joseph to flee with the baby Jesus to eat. Satan tried to kill him then. When Jesus fasted for 40 days in the desert, Satan came to confront him and tried to tempt him. And he tried to tempt him in three ways. One was to throw himself off the pinnacle of the temple. But Jesus resisted. Satan tried again the day Jesus spoke at his home synagogue in Nazareth. I preached a message on that, the whole coming with Jesus. And Satan stirred up the crowd and grabbed Jesus and dragged him to a cliff and throw him off the cliff. But he escaped. He went through the crowd untouched because he was protected. But as the serpent continually struck at Jesus, he was not a fatal blow. Then he entered Judas' chariot 
Satan entered Judas's grave and motivated him to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And I'm sure Satan and his demons laughed with glee as they observed the, the torture, the torture and the suffering at the trial and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Being beat with a cat of nine tails till the flesh was ripped from his body. His face, says his vision, was beyond recognition. Torture. Crown of hand thorn placed on his head and jammed down onto his brow. And he, lay, and he hung on the cross. And he suffered. He bled. He died. And he finally said, It is finished. I have paid the price. The price had been paid in full. Satan must have thrilled when they nailed him to the cross. And said, Aha, at last, I have killed the seed of this woman. And Jesus cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, I want to make sure you understand this. That's the only time in the Bible that Jesus ever said, My God, my God. He always said, Our Father who art in heaven. Our Father. Our Father. But here he said, My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? You know why that is? Because at that time, he had the sins of the world upon his back. Your sin, my sin, every sin that would ever be committed, ever has been committed, or ever will be committed, the penalty for that sin is on his back. And God cannot look upon sin. And so God turned his back on his only begotten son because he can't look at sin. That's why he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Oh, man, just thinking about that. One day, you can say, Lord, if you're a child of God, I'm ready to enter heaven. But if you're not a child of God, if you've never accepted Christ, <clears throat> one day you're going to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Thank God. Why have you forsaken me? If you don't know Jesus, you don't have to turn his back upon you. Somebody said, why would God send anybody to hell? Let me tell you something. God doesn't send anybody to hell. As a matter of fact, she's desired who's long suffering, not willing to finish the but all she comes to repentance. And you see, you send yourself by rejecting the cause of Jesus Christ. You came in this world condemned. Now you're safe until you reach the age of accountability. But after that age of accountability, you stand condemned. The Bible says that we're not here to come, that we're already condemned because we have not believed upon the name of the only begotten Son of God. Hmm. But when God, when He said that, He bore the sins of the world, and He was ready to pay the price. And He said, "To tell us die, to tell us die." That means it is finished. Stuck on the head of the devil and defeated him. Now, on the third day, he arose. That's what he said. This is the same story worded when they put him in the tomb. On day one, Satan, the author of death, says, Stay dead. Day two, he looked at him and said, Stay dead. On the third day, Christ the Lord had risen today. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. That grave couldn't hold him. He came up out of there, and Satan was defeated, and the devil's power of death was totally destroyed. His death, burial, resurrection, Jesus ripped the stinger out of death, and he robbed the grave of his victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? There is no victory for the devil in your death now. As a matter of fact, you don't die. You just transported to heaven. That you with the body, the soul and the spirit are separated from the body. And this coming a time when your child of God, the soul and the spirit is coming back. And going to be reunited with the resurrected body of the slave, the glorified body. Won't be no aches and pains. Somebody said, How old will you be? I have no idea, but I'll be whatever age I'm supposed to be. <laughs> Amen. But I, I, I tell you this, don't make any difference. We won't have any aches and pains. I won't even have this artificial hip I've got anymore. Uh, think about that. I just stepped off. They took that bone out of the bone coming back someday. <laughs> <laughs> Glorified in that. Glorified in that. What a, what, a, what a blessing to know that Jesus suffered and died for us, but he rose again on the third day. And he's coming back to take us home. Satan is alive, but he hasn't been well since Calvary. He was shamed, slammed, smacked down at the cross. <laughs> then there's a defeated enemy. He can't do anything but inflict damage today. Try to inflict damage. 
You may be saying, Pastor, the devil was destroyed. Why is there so much evil and suffering in the world today? As a defeated foe, Satan is trying to cause as much misery in this world as he can. He knows he can't win. He's already been beaten. He knows his eternal destiny. He knows he's going to spend eternity in hell. He was the highest angel. Lucifer, the archangel. He was in charge of all the music in heaven. And he said, I'm going to be like the most high. I'm going to be superior to God. I'm going up. I'm going up. And God said, you're going down. You're going down. And he went down. And during World War II, after the Battle of Leningrad, Leningrad was lost, it was clear that the Nazis were not going to win the war on the Eastern Front. So Hitler ordered what he called the scorched earth policy. As Nazis retreated, they destroyed everything that might be useful to the enemy. That scorched earth policy was so particularly brutal in the Ukraine. In 1943, uh, the uh, SS commander Himmler issued the following order. He said, quote, leave behind the Ukraine not a single person, no cattle, no fuel, grain, not a railroad track. The total town must be totally, the country must be left totally burned and destroyed. Nazi, in quote, Nazi soldiers then tore up railroad tracks, burned thousands of towns, and even gave the citizens of churches and burned the churches to the ground with the citizens inside of it. That's what the devil is going to do today. In the same way the devil knows he's a defeated foe, he's trying to cause as much damage as he can until the end. So we still have to be aware of his strategy. He's still going to try to attack you. He's still going to try to inflict pain in your life. And he will. But God will see you through that. God will see you through that suffering. Peter warned, he said, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Since the cross, the devil is a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. But here's the deal. At the cross, you got all these people he can't do any damage now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He is a toothless, roaring lion. Now, a lion has to roar. Because it's not as fast as some of the other animals. And it, it, can't, it, can't, it can't catch them. They try to sneak up on their prey. And that's what the devil tried to do. The devil won't come at you. That's something that you will recognize. Because if you recognize it, you'd go away from it. Mm -hmm. But he will come at you with something that looks enticing. That it's tempting to. And that's when he sneak up on That's why he tells that's why he tells our young people and our old people. All these that, that drug will hurt you, make you feel good. He don't tell you what it's gonna lead to. He don't tell you, oh this affair, it, it, it's just that it's an affair. No, it's not it's adultery. Amen? He doesn't tell you the broken home is gonna lead to. See, he comes as something beautiful. An angel of light. But he brings with him darkness and destruction. Flee from him. Flee from him. That's what makes it so hard to live a Christian life. Exactly. The devil throws everything he can at you to make you turn back from Jesus or try to make you turn away from him. But you listen. You can't turn away from God. You can get away from him as far as not knowing, not living for him. But thank God if you're saved, you're his child. And I promise you this. God will let your leash go out just so far, and then he'll jerk it back. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when he jerks that leash back, it's not comfortable. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. If you've experienced that, say amen. Amen! amen. amen. I have. He roars, but he can't catch, huh? Once lunchtime. Once yeah, lunchtime. <laughs> Jack Taylor used to be pastor of Castle Hill Baptist Church in Texas. And uh, he wrote this about the devil. He said, Satan's defeat did not remove him from the picture. He's still very much with us. His past defeat assures Christ's present, uh, present domination over him. He is vanquished, but not banished. Present, but not prevailing. Active, but not able to overcome us. Satan is being crushed in the battlefields of this world where believers have learned the truth about their enemy being a defeated foe. You've learned that, Vic? You've learned that lesson? He's defeated. What are Satan's strategies? is to remind you of your past failures. Oh, there are people. <laughs> he will remind you of your past failures. The Bible says, 
Because his accuser of the brother and sister, even though your sin has been forgiven, he continually tries to remind you of how wicked and evil you, are, you used to be. And one time he said, he said, was an angel in heaven, trying to exalt himself. God cast him down. I had somebody ask me yesterday, uh, you know, to tell me about somebody that was struggling with, they become a Christian, but they struggle with the fact that sometimes they committed the same sin over and over again. Well, let me tell you something. They wonder, can God forgive? How many times can God forgive? I don't know. All I know is He will forgive you. The point I tried to make is this. Think about it for a moment. Now, I believe the Holy Spirit will convict you to the point if you do, if you repeat the same sin over and over again, chastisement is going to come upon you. Okay, there's going to be some chastisement. But the sin is forgiven. The consequences may still be there, but the sin is forgiven. Look at it this way. When you ask God forgiveness for your sin, what happens to it? It goes away. That goes away. He literally forgets about it. So if you come back to him the next day, he chooses. He forgets because he chooses to forget. Not because he's forgetful, but because he chooses. But it's forgotten. And it's a perfect forgetting. He's perfect in forgiving and forgetting. So the next day, or the next week, the same thing happens again. And you come to him and you say, Lord, forgive me. I have sinned again. He doesn't say, well, yeah, I remember you did that last week. No, this is the first time you've been to it. Because he's forgotten. And he forgives that and he's forgotten. But there will come a point at which the Holy Spirit will say, okay, that's enough. We're going to change this. And he works to change this. And that changing, many times, it can either be a, a peaceful change or sometimes he can bring things into our lives that we don't want to change. Amen. 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 Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. <coughs> Wash that thing till it's worn slap out. That does it. Yep. Got holes in it. In Revelation 12, we learn that Satan will be, he still has, he still has access to God in heaven. It says in Job 1 that he came before um, God and angels in heaven. He still has access to it. And he stands because he stands there as an accuser. Look at what look at what you did. Look at what so and so did. That's going to be your child. And you look how they did look what they did. He stands as an accuser. And then Christ says, Father, I paid the price for that. They're forgiven. They're under my blood. Yeah. But that don't get you excited. Something's wrong. That's like that's like going to a courtroom. Being found guilty. And somebody saying, Yeah, but I'm going to serve the penalty for it. He can go free. <laughs> what would you do to that person? They said, you're, you're sentenced 20, 30 years in prison. And somebody steps up and says, It's all right. I'm going to take their place. What would you do? You'd grab them and throw a kiss on them like they ain't never seen them. <laughs> Amen. Take your penalty for you. Well, that's what Christ did for you. That's why we all fall in love with that's Jesus right. Christ. Yeah. Think about what he did for us. Think about the suffering. Think about the torture. Think about everything he did just because he loved us. Yeah. He didn't get one thing out of that except the pleasure of knowing that you, that he died for your sin. And to him, that, he kind of destroyed. He kind of destroyed. I'll never understand that. I'll never understand that. But he did. I have uh, uh, lost my place. Hang on one second. Let's see if I find it back. There it is. Um, and I'm going to close this message with this. Because the devil was disarmed at the cross. We can face death without fear. Are you hearing? Because of the cross, you can face death without fear. We all are going to die if the Lord doesn't come back. I've seen too many people suffer. Bertrand Russell was a famous British academician and writer. But he wasn't a Christian. In 1927, he wrote a book called Why I Am Not a Christian. I've read that book. He was aiming, when he was 81 years old, BBC interviewed him, and the interviewer asked him, now remember, he's 81, get close to death. 
What do you have to hang on to when death is so obviously so close? And he replied, I have nothing to hang on to but grim, unyielding despair. And he lived 16 more years and died at 97 years of age. Mm. Compare that to believers who have recently died, whether they were in the hospital or at home or whatever happened on an automobile accident. Listen, especially the ones in the hospitals at home that died at home, they were looking forward to leaving a frail body and entering into the joyful presence of the Lord. Paul said for me to live as Christ to die as gain. It's a head dog and tail dog in proposition. In other words, as a child of God, you can't lose. If I live as Jesus, serving him, following him, and glorifying him, if I die, it's even better. I'm with him. So what does a Christian gain in death? Well, just a few things. We gain the physical presence of Jesus. What we see by faith now, we will see by sight then. We will see him face to face and behold all of his glory. And we'll gain the fellowship of all those saints who have gone on before us. I'll see my brother, I'll see my mother, my father, and I'll see George's mom and dad, and we'll have time to fellowship. And she and if Carolina played basketball, she said, Roy, have to pop some popcorn. <laughs> well, she used to tell me every time they play, she said, Go pop some popcorn. And I know we'd sit there and watch the game, eat popcorn, have a good time. I can't wait to ask David why he picked up five stones when he broke Goliath that day. I want, to ask Moses, I want to ask Moses what it was like to lead a group of griping people in the desert for 40 years. <laughs> Sometimes preachers think they had it rough. All they need to do is go around and read about Moses and what he went through. I haven't experienced any of that. I want to, think, I want to ask Esther what it was like to be the first beauty queen. And let me mention one more thing. At death, we gave freedom. I said this to the I want to emphasize it. We gave freedom from pain and sickness. I've watched too many people suffer and die. The older we get, the more aches and pains we get. Some of you live with pain every day. Some of you live with depression. Some of you have disabilities and struggles that make life difficult. At death, you gain that freedom. I, I, when I worked at Rex Hospital, I was a biomedical technician. And I was here at the church part time. Well, I was there part time here at the church as pastor. They put me on the chaplaincy staff. Yeah. And uh, I got a call one day. The dad in the biomedical room, and they called me and they said, can you go up and talk to family? Actually, wanted to go up and talk to a man who was approaching death. He just had, he just had they said, maybe hours to live. So I went up to his room, and I tried to talk to him about the Lord, make sure he was saved. He said, I don't hear nothing about that. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear anything about that. And I said, sir, please, let me just tell you. No, I don't want to hear it. So I left. A few minutes later, a few, about an hour later, I guess, the family called me. They said, can you come back up here? He's all over. He's, he's dying. I walked into that room, and I said to him, sir, would you, I don't want to hear that. And then all of a sudden, he started screaming. The fire, it's burning. It's burning my feet. Help me. Put it out. 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 And he died. That was without Jesus. True story. And then I've seen Mr. Baldwin. Can't remember his first name. Ellis Baldwin. How many of you remember Ellis Baldwin was here for a while? He died. We were there in the hospital when he died. We stood around. We sang him. The Lord just transported him to the Lord. Curtis Whitney's daughter, Linda. And she died. She was in the hospital. I was up there with Curtis and the family. And she turned over and looked at him, took her last breath, closed her eyes, and went to be with Jesus. Curtis jumped up, grabbed her hand, got everybody around the bed, and he said, Thank you, Lord. He started praying, Thank you, Lord, for letting me have her all these years. I didn't know why I could have done that at all. But that's what it means to die with Christ. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. If you don't know the Lord as your Savior, there's an eternity of hell that waits. How long is the eternity? Well, I can't tell you. As a matter of fact, nobody can tell you how long eternity is. It's never ending. 
Everybody's living for something or someone. I want you to fill in the blank for me. And, and I want you to be brutally honest with yourself now. Don't give me a preacher answer. Because God already knows. I want you to fill in this. For me to live is, what would you put in that blank? You living for money? For success? For popularity? Give it the 4T test. What do you think about most? What do you talk about most? Where do you invest most of your time? And where do you invest most of your treasure? And that's probably, if you answer those questions, that'll tell you where you where you probably put that blank. Now, if you put money in the blank, you're going to have to say, to live is money, to die is loss. If you put pleasure in there, you're going to say, for me to live, uh, for me to live is pleasure, you're going to have to say, to die is loss. If you put something as double as your family in there, I, it can be something good. But if you, if you put for me to live is my family, you just have to say to die lost. For me to live is Christ. Christ alone. Now, everything else takes its proper place. The family takes its proper place after Christ. I don't know if you caught the breaking news. It came out yesterday. Not everybody, not every radio station and TV station announced it because they take it for granted. Yesterday, yesterday, one day, about 7,000 Americans died. A little over 7,000. That's a new statistic. Every day, about 7,000 people in America die. They go out into eternity. But when you can say, for me, you live as Christ, that's 300 people an hour in America. 300 people an hour pass out of your journey. Let me tell you, I'm not trying to scare you, but I would scare you. If I could scare you out of hell, I would. But I'm, the Holy Spirit's got to drag you. He's got to pull you in. He's got to pull you into the family of God. But I will tell you this. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Somewhere right now, they are making a casket that you may inhabit tonight. We have no guarantee. They may be preparing a vault that they'll lower you into in a couple of days. So we need to make sure we live as Christ. And to die is dead. There should be no fear. We're going home. We're going to see Jesus. So if you're a child of God, say, go ahead and get that casket ready. Because I'm ready for it. He's ready for me. Yeah, you know, truthfully. That's the reason, folks, I don't let this COVID mess and this is still going out over the internet and I'm still preaching. I don't let this COVID mess bother me. I'm determined that if I'm, I'm going home to be with Jesus when Jesus is ready for me. Amen. Whether he takes me by a car accident, whether he takes me by COVID, whether, whether, however he takes me, that's how I'm going home. And you know what? I'm going home when he's ready for me, and I'm not going until he is. Amen. It's in his hands. It's in his By the way, for those of you that don't get Facebook, I put it on there. I want you to notice something. Oh, they'll cut me off for this one. <laughs> I promise you. I mean, how many of you know that they're recalling the rapid antigen test. Imagine that. Huh? Imagine that. Imagine that. And they are recalling it because they found that there were so many false positives and false negatives with it. That means some people who had COVID came back negative and some people who did not have COVID came back positive. And it's about a 50-50 shot. I'm surprised I'm not either. I told you to start with <laughs> Especially the rapid test. And then Bill Gates and George Soros bought up the company in from what? From uh, England. Can you imagine that? Ah. <laughs> so, if you were tested with the rapid test and you tested positive, you may not have had it. If you tested negative, you may have had it. <laughs> so, you don't know. No kind of like a true or false question. Yeah, kind of good point. Um, that's the reason. And, and I'll tell you something. There have been organizations that recognize that to begin with. The uh, NCAA, Brian's a, uh, my son is a basketball referee, Division I ref. 
And uh, they would not allow them, they had to be tested before every game that they refed. But they would not allow them to be tested with a rapid test. They had to get the regular test where they had to send in UPS a day ahead of time and all that kind of stuff. So they knew, they knew it was false. But anyhow, back to what I said. You know what, COVID or anything else should not scare a child of God. Now, you know, you can use good common sense. You can't stand out there in front of a Mack truck and expect it to stop. I mean, you can use good common sense. But what I'm saying to you is you're not going to, if you're a child of God, you're not going home until he's ready for you. And when he's ready for you, you're not going to delay your party. So make sure your ticket's punched and ready to go. No, Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Amen. The devil's power to scare people with the threat of dying is destroyed at the cross. So rejoice that you have the victory over death. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed for just a moment. No one looking around. Let me ask you a question. How many of you know you got that victory through the shed blood of Jesus Christ? And a word of testimony. Lift that hand up. Come. Give testimony for him. Thank you. God bless you. You could not raise your hand. Now let me say this to you. Listen to me. Death comes to everyone, and it doesn't know any age limit. Young, old, makes no difference. If you're not sure, if you can't say, say for me to die is Christ to live is gain, you're not sure of your salvation, you've never been saved, never asked the Lord into your heart, would you let me pray for you? Would you just slip up your hands and preach and pray for me? I'm not saved. I'm not sure I'm saved. Anyone at all? It's your decision. Don't put it off. Christian, we live sometimes in fear. The Bible says perfect love casteth out fear. If you love the Lord today and you're his child, then you have victory over anything that tries to harm you. Because ultimately, you're going to be with Jesus. You need to come this morning, I think, and just give him a shout of victory or a prayer of praise at the altar and say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for loving me so much and suffering so much and dying for me to give me victory. To get, take away the fear of death from my life. Lord, I want to praise you. Would you stand to your feet, please? Heavenly Father, may your children respond to your spirit. And Lord, for those that need salvation, may they come. Let us show them how to be saved today. While she plays. May your spirit have his way. Where you go right now? Just give him praise and honor and glory for what he's done for you in your life. Perhaps for saving you, for putting you on a new road, for forgiving all your sins, for giving you victory, for taking away the fear of death. You say, well, I've never been there. Well, I, I, I haven't been there either. But I thought I was when I had that heart attack. I really thought I was going to heaven. And I can tell you now, my wife can tell you. And I wasn't scared at all. I wasn't scared. I had promise about me. I thought, well, the Lord's ready for me. I'm ready to go. I did ask him. I said, Lord, let me stay long enough to show my wife how to pay the bills. He did, I still haven't done it. But I had, a, I, had a, I had a peace. That that was my time I was ready. So I know there is no fear in death. Now I'm not going to run out here and do something crazy. But my hand is in the Lord's hand. He's got control of me. He's got control of my life. And you know what? He does a whole lot better manage it than I do when I try to. A whole lot better. Would you come? while she's playing.
Jesus' children said, 